like to introduce uh, Dr. Herzberg from the National Research Council, Canada, Nobel Prize winner from 1971. Or, and Dr. Herzberg, I would like to ask you about uh, how is it to, to get the Nobel Prize? How does it feel? How it, does it feel, yeah. Well, uh, it's a great surprise when you get it. And, I mean, you have no advanced information. Uh -huh. And so, I uh, uh, I was in uh, I happened to be in the Soviet Union uh -huh. at the time. This was on the second of November in 1971, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I gave a lecture. I, I was uh, going from from Moscow to Leningrad to give a lecture there, and. This was in the morning of a certain day, and then uh, my host, Professor Frisch, uh, who is known for his work on atomic spectra, uh, he left the group that was with me, and when he came back, he said, there's a rumor that you have the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so it was a really <laughs> huge surprising. <you> know, <laughs> yeah, well, what do you do with that, you see? Uh -huh. But fortunately, well, and I was going to leave in the afternoon with the train. I didn't want to go with the night train because I had come by night train and I didn't like the Russian night trains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I but the, uh, the academy was aware of that. And, and after the, my friends, my, uh, my colleagues, took me to the station, they left me there and immediately afterwards somebody came in and he showed me a card and uh, he was from the academy and said they had confirmed that I had the Nobel Prize for physics, he for said. Physics. And that I didn't understand quite. And here I was in the train for six hours between Leningrad and, and uh, Moscow, and nobody to talk to or discuss anything with anybody, mm -hmm. and won wondering how could it be in physics. Mm -hmm. And of course it wasn't in physics, it was in chemistry. Mm -hmm. that was chemistry. Just a which I found out as soon as I arrived in Moscow, because they, not only were some of my friends there at the station, but there was a crowd of reporters and so on. And well, yeah, you can imagine that too. Yeah. Well, for example, Professor uh, Mandelstam, who was mm -hmm. my, my host, uh, said, you must be tired, you see, and so on. He said, yes, I'm tired, but I certainly won't be able to sleep. Well, you come with us. And so he took me to his home, together with Professor Sobelman, whom you may, mm -hmm. uh, whose name you may have heard, and who's still around. Uh, Mandelstam died, I think, a couple of years ago. And uh, and we had a very nice evening. And, uh, and it's very rare, actually, that at that time people took you took you to their homes. So. Uh, Nice, but of course, the aftermath of comes along, and that you get all sorts of invitations. Mm -hmm. I got sort of in on the average for the first year, I got one invitation a day. One invitation a day to yeah. give a lecture yeah. or attend uh, some function, or uh, and uh, there's still quite uh, often that I get invitations that I cannot possibly accept. And, mm -hmm. But it's no no longer one a day, maybe one a week or so. <laughs> so, if you look back uh, and compare with science or, or research 40 years, 30 years ago and research now, what do you feel about it? Well, the, uh, the striking thing, of course, is it's very different now than it was in the sense that uh, Everyone has a computer in front of him. You see. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any computers. We used the, uh, my, my first work uh, for the first uh, five, ten years was done with a hand computer. You turn the wheel, you see, and, and uh, all the measurements were evaluated by such an old fashioned kind of, uh, if you call it, computer. Mm -hmm. So that, and, and that's only one uh, feature, but then of course now you have lasers and and what not, mm -hmm. and, and you, uh, it's a very different situation now uh, 
from what it was at that time. You did all, uh, most of the things you did yourself. Of course, there was a workshop there, and uh, sometimes uh, the workshop was very good. So, uh, for example, in, back in Germany, I had, uh, uh, there was a shop there, uh, and the man in charge of it was a very nice fellow when he built uh, two or three spectrographs for me. We couldn't afford to buy one, so mm -hmm. they were built in, in, in the lab. And uh, so uh, all that uh, you, you can no longer do because the experiment, the machinery, the equipment, it's so complicated that you have to buy certain things, and so everything is more expensive. And the, but the striking thing to me nowadays is always when I see, look around the lab, everyone sits in front of a computer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether that's a good thing, I feel a little doubtful about it. Uh, I mean, uh, some people then get the impression, well, all that these people do is just turn the wheel of the computer without actually turning anything, you press the keys with the <laughs> So in, in that sense, I think every, everything is very, very different. But when it really comes down to the physics or chemistry or whatever astronomy that you are doing, it, it isn't all that different. Yeah, but you can compare. We, looking into our C3 spectra, okay, we use all this technique, computer yeah. and uh, new Fourier transform spectrometer. Uh, but uh, after that, we have a spectra. And we have to do maybe the same what you did yeah, uh, exactly. 20 or 30 years ago. Only that uh, resolution, of course, is nowadays so much better. Mm -hmm. So that you get far more details. And that means you have far more molecular constants to evaluate. And, uh, and so it becomes really more difficult. It's quite, uh, well, particularly for, as, as you get on in, in years, as I have. Uh, and uh, on my way to Saskatoon, I dropped in in Princeton, and I met Professor Condon, you know, Frank Condon fame. And he just had uh, accepted to be editor the series of a series of physics books for the Prentice Hall Company, Prentice Hall Publishing Company. And he immediately asked me, well, uh, could we publish a translation of your book on atomic spectrum, you see, because he, he looked, he glanced over the proofs. Uh, and so that started another publisher, in, 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 in an American publisher, to be interested in my books, and of course this was only the first of, of four books, really. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, when I then came to Saskatoon, uh, Dr. Spinks, John Spinks, was uh, quite anxious to do the translation, and so it came. The translation came out uh, about just a year after the German version. So the first was the, the German version of, uh, yeah, of your book? that was the first yeah. one, yes. And, uh, and the next? And then, of course, the, uh, came the diatomic molecules. You see, originally, uh, I was, uh, the plan was for me to write a book of about uh, 200 pages about atomic and molecular spectra. Mm -hmm. And I started with atomic spectra, and when I was finished with that, I had already 200 pages, you see. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it had to be s split. So the second book the volume was to be on molecular spectrum. And when I had done the diatomic molecules, and again, it was obvious it couldn't be all included, so it was split again. And then when I had came to the polyatomic molecules, again, it turned out it was too much, and so it became three, volume, three and a half volumes, you might say. And uh, somebody made the remark, uh, I don't know who it was, really. I don't know if you know the story about uh, uh, Richard Wagner, uh, when he uh, wrote, uh, wrote the music for the, the, uh, the Nibelung. Uh, and he, he wanted to write one opera, namely on Siegfried's death, you see. And when he came, uh, he ended up with one Vorspiel 
and three operas, uh -huh. just as I had one four spiel. Four spiel and <laughs> two operas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you work on your books? Well, I mean, I worked, of course, not uh, all my time because I did other things as well. So, but I, I can tell you the last, the volume three, uh, I, st I remember starting on the 1st of January 1960. 1960, and I finished roughly in January 1966. Ah, six years. Six years. And I used, at that time, I think I told somebody uh, the other day, uh, I, I uh, used every uh, Saturday and every other holiday other than Sundays, uh, and there are 12 of, of this kind in, in, on this continent, you see. so. Uh, and, and on those days, I would work from eight to six, uh, solidly. And uh, it's only that way that I could get it really done because there's all the many other distra distractions and, and of course other kind of work. I mean, in the same years, I, well, I would have to look at the list of publications. I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't mute. <laughs> So, uh, uh, but I mean, the other, you see, the, the number of pages is something of the order of 2,000 pages. 2,000 pages. I, okay. I figured that I spent about one eight hour day on one page. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> it's a really hard job. Yeah, well, I wouldn't quite like to go through that again. <laughs> <laughs> you met the many famous uh, scientists. Do you remember yes. some of them? Well, I mean, starting with, uh, I would say, with James Frank. Mm -hmm. You know, Frank and Pondon. Uh, mm -hmm. I, of course, I was, uh, after I got my PhD, if you call it that, uh, I had uh, a year in Göttingen. That was the time when James Frank was still there, Frank and Born. And that was really the high time of, I, I mean, at that time I met Wigner, for example. He was in Göttingen for a month or something. And a lot of other people, like uh, even Heisenberg was there, but he was there only a very short time. And I, I remember Middle Raman. Yeah, uh, Raman I had, well, I always liked to tell the story about uh, when I came to England, you see, after Göttingen, I, one year in Göttingen, in Göttingen, I met Leonard Jones, I don't know whether you know of the name, but he was very much interested in, in uh, the theory of molecular bonds and all this. And uh, he was in Göttingen for just uh, six months. And he asked me whether I wouldn't like to come to Bristol in England for on a fellowship or scholarship. And that appealed to me because it gave me a chance to learn English properly and so on. And it was very, very lucky that I did. Uh, because uh, <coughs> uh, when I came to this country uh, in, in Saskatoon, I could start lecturing at the first, on the first day. Uh, anyway, uh, but the point of my story is really that uh, when I came to Bristol, a few days after I got there, there was a meeting of the Faraday Society, an international meeting on molecular uh, problems, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, which was very interesting. But uh, I always tell the story. The first speaker was Richardson, O. W. Richardson. Of, uh, I don't know if you're sure you're familiar with the name, and uh, uh, he was an awful lecturer, and I couldn't understand a word. <laughs> was saying, and I thought, good heavens, for a whole year in a country where you don't understand the language, you know. But then the next speaker was Rama, and he was a brilliant lecturer. Mm -hmm. I could understand every word he said, mm -hmm. because he pronounced it properly, and <laughs> with diction and with enthusiasm, while Richardson was just mumbling, you know. I encountered lots of people who mumble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But uh, Raman really was uh, quite a, 
quite a lecture. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was the year after uh, this meeting in, in Bristol of the Faraday Society that Raman got the Nobel Prize. So he was already a famous man at the time, you know. And, well, and lots of stories were been tell about him. But, and I don't know whether you realize that uh, uh, Chandra Sekhar, uh, whom I met on the, uh, only a few years later, uh, turned out to be the nephew of Rama. He never told me. I, I, was, uh, I had my office opposite his office at the Archives Observatory. We had lots of talks about Raman and other people. But he never mentioned with one word that Raman was his uncle. Uh -huh. <laughs> I found that out somehow later on, <laughs> much later. And, uh, well, they're the same sort of, I mean, Shandazeka is, of course, a fantastic mathematician. And, mm -hmm. and, but as a, as a lecturer, you couldn't beat Raman. So Raman was really, really good. Uh, he was really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now you were asking about other people I, I met. I was all, uh, or people always ask me whether I met Einstein. Well, mm -hmm. the answer is I once saw him. I, I went to a colloquium in Berlin. I was in Berlin only for a few days. That's the only time I was in Berlin. And, uh, there was a colloquium. And in this colloquium, I don't know who the speaker was, but the fact was that in the first row was Einstein and Planck. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in the last row. Mm -hmm. And that was in my contact with mm -hmm. Einstein <laughs> and Planck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. That's beautiful. But uh, were there many other people I, I met? I mean, of course, uh, as you uh, know from the literature, I wrote a paper with uh, Teller. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was a brilliant man and also a brilliant lecturer. And uh, uh, at that time, there was no uh, atomic energy and all this. And so, uh, there's never any problem. But you may, I've told the story on other occasions that uh, when after the war, with all the bombs, atomic bombs and whatnot, uh, Teller was interviewed by, uh, well, no, yeah, Teller, there, there were two newspaper men who wrote a biography of Edward Teller, and uh, he gave them all the information, he wrote you know, all his books and so on, and at the end, they asked him, now, Professor Teller, uh, if you look back at your scientific work, which of your scientific work gave you most satisfaction? Did he? turned around and said, my work in molecular spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great I didn't hear him say that, yeah. but that's what they say uh -huh. in this book, in the, in the biography. Uh -huh. That's what they say he had told them. Uh -huh. And I found that rather that's, touching. That's nice. I also emphasize that, uh, of course, I'm not a mate, or, uh, uh, I'm not a, I can't compete. Two or? Well, there's one series of gatherings that was introduced in Germany, the, in Lindau, if you know. It's in Lake Constance, you know, uh, Bodensee. And, uh, and I, in fact, I just have an invitation to go there again in next July, uh, next June. And they invite uh, oh, something like 20 Nobel laureates, depending on what, mm -hmm. whom they can get. Mm -hmm. And the main uh, idea in that meeting, in those meetings, is to uh, uh, let uh, younger scientists and students uh, ha get a chance to have some contact with if, uh, Nobel laureates. Right. I remember my time in Germany. I got uh, this you, uh, Humboldt Fellowship. Oh and yeah. I also was invited, you were, you invited uh, to, to 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 Linda oh or yes, for yes. one week. And yeah, it's a so beautiful one week. To, to to really. Uh, they have about 500 to... young people there, yeah. and perhaps 20 or 25 Nobel laureates. Mm -hmm. And uh, it works out very well, and they have maintained it now for 40 years. It was right after the war in Germany, they thought, to bring up, uh, to, to get the, the news about outside science into Germany, you know, mm -hmm. and get some prominent people in.
and it worked really very well. And, uh, so when did you come to uh, Canada? I came to Canada in 1935. 35, and you started in Saskatchewan, or I started in Saskatchewan. I was there for 10 years, but I, I went to Saskatchewan. Uh, I mean, people have often asked me why, why did you pick Saskatchewan, but. Uh, mm -hmm. At the time that I left Germany in 1935, uh, of course, that was two years after the Nazis came. And uh, uh, most of the, and, and since I'm myself not Jewish, I first thought, oh, well, I don't need to worry about that. But, uh, because my, my wife, my first wife, was, uh, was Jewish, and that was considered a crime by the Nazis, you see, to marry a Jew. And it's certainly, as, a, uh, as one who has a Jewish wife, you couldn't teach at a university. Mm -hmm. And it's poor students who would have to suffer. <laughs> and uh, so I knew uh, by about 1934 that somehow I would have to leave, find a different job. And I was very, very lucky in the fact that one of the people from Canada, that is from Saskatchewan, uh, wrote to me whether he could spend a year in my lab in Germany. He came in 1933, that is shortly after the Nazis. They came in January 33, and he came in the summer of 33. And he worked with me, and he made the connection with Saskatchewan. And while they, uh, of course, I would have tried to, I would have liked to go to Toronto or someplace like that, mm -hmm. but uh, that didn't work out. And then in Saskatchewan, the president of the university offered me the job. And I was there for 10 years, never regretted it. I felt very, very lucky. In fact, I was uh, grateful to Mr. Hitler that he. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and when did you come to, to Ottawa? I came to Ottawa in 1948. That is, uh, from Saskatchewan, I went for three years to. The Yerkes Observatory, that is University mm -hmm. of Chicago. And, uh, and then from there I went to Toronto. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, uh, I mean, my family uh, didn't really like it all that much. In, in we were not in Chicago, we were in, in at this place where the observatory is, in, in southern Wisconsin. And uh, the, Having lived in, in, in Saskatoon, Canada, for 10 years. So, when we interrupted, was I talking about Teller still at the time? Yeah, you can. Because uh, I emphasize the fact that this paper that we wrote together on selection rules, you might say, for vibrational transitions in the electronic spectra of polyatomic molecules. Uh, that was really Teller's work, but he was too lazy, if you like, to write it. Mm -hmm. And I got it out of him. And then he said, well, you write it, you see. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, he was, at that time at any rate, he was very much uh, like that. He had all sorts of ideas. He talked to somebody. And, and about a certain problem, you see. And uh, this somebody then thought that they would write a joint paper. He said, you, you write it up. You write I, it. I don't want to bother with this. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, uh, so he was very liberal in, in that way. But anyway, he was an interesting person to, to be associated with. I, I, I don't like his development into a, what would you call him, a, an expert on atomic bombs. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was far too much pressing for the further development, you see, of uh, hydrogen bomb and all this kind of thing, and then this SDI or whatever it's called. And uh, anyway, uh, but he was certainly one person I had a lot of contact with. Incidentally, he also was a good musician. Uh, and uh, my brother was uh, somewhat of a pianist, and uh, they played it some uh, when he when Teller visited. They played uh, uh, two. Uh, what do you call it? Four hands. Four hands. Yes. 
and <laughs> this sort of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, Taylor certainly has a very great uh, appreciation of music, you no know, question of that. But uh, now, what other people can I talk about? Uh, well, one person that you probably don't know about, but uh, that I felt very much uh, attracted to was uh, Bonhoeffer. You know, he was the person who discovered orthoparahydrogen. Uh, and, but he was also a very, very fine person. And uh, uh, in fact, he, I had a visit from him uh, immediately after the war uh, here in, in, in Ottawa. Uh, he suffered very much because he was quite outspoken. And, and uh, in fact, his brother was uh, executed because he was in some way involved in this plot of the July, June 24th or whatever, 1938, uh, no, mm -hmm. oh, no, well, never mind, anyway. Uh, and so, uh, and, and this one of her, Carl Friedrich one of her, who, uh, a very fine physical chemist. In fact, he, there's a, one of the Max Planck Institutes is named after him in, in Göttingen. Anyway, he was one of the people whom I greatly admired. And uh, then, of course, there are people like, uh, what's his name now? The person who made. Uh, Einstein write the letter to uh, to Roosevelt. What's his name? Hungarian chap. I'm sure you know the name, but my memory for names has disappeared. Anyway, uh, I just saw recently uh, uh, he died oh, quite a number of years ago. But there was a book about a uh, biography which I hope to get get hold of. That was published recently. Is quite an extraordinary person. Yeah. And then, of course, one of the people who is very, was very, very impressive is Fermi. Yeah, an incredible man. A very, very fine lecturer. Of the type, you know, that... And he's, of course, both theoretician and experimentalist. But he was of the type that... Uh, when you heard his lecture, you thought everything was 100% clear. And then when you came out, now. This. How was that, you know? <laughs> and then you realized that you didn't really understand it. But he was a very, very good lecturer, one of the best. Yeah. And uh, then, of course, there were people like Robert Mulliken, you see. Mm -hmm. He was one of the really poor lecturers in the class of uh, O.W. Richardson, you see. And uh, I only found out uh, a couple of years ago or so the story that, I don't know who told the story, but it doesn't matter. It's, it sounds too. Uh, when when uh, Mulliken was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize, you see, uh, one of his friends was talking to him and said, now when you go to Stockholm, you really have to prepare that lecture that you were given there. And then Mulliken told him, just one prepare lectures. <laughs> 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 but that's, that's how he lectured. <laughs> so that's Robert Mulliken. And having read just uh, yesterday uh, this, uh, oh yes, the last issue of uh, Journal of Molecular Spectroscopy has uh, uh, an article in the beginning about uh, Wright Wilson. In fact, his son, Kenneth. Uh, Wilson is writing this sort of very short statement uh, about his father, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's quite interesting to read. And he was certainly a very fine contributor to molecular spectroscopy, no question of that. So having known him was quite nice. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, <coughs> Because I had, on this continent, I had really only two students, I mean two 
people who got their PhD degree, because Saskatchewan at the time didn't give a degree, PhD degree. And, uh, <coughs> and those are uh, Narari Rao, mm -hmm. most of you, mm -hmm. both of you I'm sure, know about. And uh, John Phillips, who is uh, in the astronomy department mm -hmm. in Berkeley. Okay, so this is, the name is uh, the Phillips Band? Or yes, the this, that's the one, that's the one, yes, yes, that's the one. And he, uh, well, they both got their degrees in, in Berk at uh, the Yerkes Observatory. Yerkes and uh, we, n nobody was very impressed by the performance of uh, Rao in his exam, you know. And everybody knows him now, and he did very, very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you cannot predict. <laughs> I had the chance to measure D3 plus here. Yeah. And I know that uh, you also tried mm -hmm. uh, to measure air. At yeah. the beginning, it was yeah, the H3 beginning, plus, yeah. yeah, to get the spectrum yeah. of H3, H3 plus. Can you tell me something about uh, the well, first time? Yes. Uh, uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, of course we had Takeshi Oka in, in the lab for 10 years, was it, or something of that order. And, uh, of course, we had many, many discussions. And one of our discussions was one should get a spectrum of H3 plus, you see. And uh, then there are two different methods of doing it by absorption technique or by emission. And we decided that uh, Okad tries the absorption technique and I would try the emission technique. And uh, uh, well, we found a spectrum, uh, about, yeah, in 1979, which for the first moment we didn't know what it was, when we you had a discharge through hydrogen at liquid nitrogen temperature and hollow cathode. And uh, then uh, uh, it suddenly dawned on me that uh, this spectrum, uh, well, it couldn't be H3 plus because uh, you couldn't imagine to have a, this was a spectrum in the visible region, and you couldn't imagine how H3 plus could have a spectrum in the visible region because all the excited states were unstable according to theory at any rate. And so I had the idea that it was neutral H3. And that turned out to be right. And uh, I mean, in fact, uh, at that time, it was a very easy uh, thing to do in a way. And uh, uh, when it first dawned on me that it was H3, I of course didn't think it could be right or, anyway, I talked to Alec Douglas, you see, he would and he was always very, very good in discussions of this sort. And when he said, yes, that seems to be right, mm -hmm. then I felt confident that I could go on and, mm -hmm. and, and it turned out to be uh, rather a nice spectrum, but it wasn't H3+. Plus, it was. And then one year later, one year later, uh, Oka found, just before he left here, that was still here in this lab, he found H, the spectrum of H3+, plus. it is the infrared spectrum of the vibrational spectrum of the And uh, so... Uh, so it's a history of uh, H3+. Yeah. Plus and of course, H3 uh, here. The, the detection of H3+, plus, which surely must be present in interstellar cloud, is still somewhat cloudy, if you like. There's only one case where it's maintained that they, people have really observed in interstellar clouds H3+. Plus. But uh, it certainly is an important ion. Now, let's see. OK, thank you very much. Well, it's my pleasure. Nice talk. Very and nice to have you here. And th thank you very hope much. hope we for see you again. Yeah, nice two years here in Canada. Very good. And uh, maybe we will meet in in Europe somewhere. Yes. Yeah. I would like to come back sometimes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it's a great pleasure to be well, here. Well, very nice to have you here. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, yeah.